This episode has been brought to you in part by the Azrieli Music Prizes. Join them in celebrating artistic excellence at the AMP Gala Concert, live from Maison Symphonique in Montreal, happening October 20th at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Orchestre Metropolitain will premiere award-winning music by laureates Aharon Harla, Iman Habibi, and Rita Ueda. Learn more at azrielifoundation.org backslash AMP. The members of this holy congregation, together with all of the communities of Canada and the Commonwealth, deeply mourn the passing of our Sovereign Lady, Queen Elizabeth II, who has gone to her eternal rest. That's the voice of Rabbi Robin Fryer Bodzin of Beth Sedek Synagogue in Toronto during Saturday's morning services, leading the congregation in a special prayer in the wake of the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Now, I covered the royal tour to Canada in 84 for CBC Radio in Moncton, and you're not supposed to stick your microphone anywhere near the Queen while she's on her walkabout and talking with people in the crowd. Journalists are supposed to wait a few paces behind. But Prince Philip stopped. He spied me holding up my mic, and I guess it's totally breaking royal protocol, but he grabbed the mic and he started interviewing me. And the tape was running, and he said, who are you talking to? And I was so flabbergasted, I was babbling, uh, uh, you! Anyway, I think he got a really good laugh out of playing this prank on me. I actually still have that tape somewhere. But that's one of the things that is so amazing about Queen Elizabeth, that despite all the castles and the controversy, so many people have a cherished story about their own connection with her and her family. Although it has rankled the Jewish community that despite the Queen travelling to over a 100 countries, that she never set foot in Israel. The older Jewish people, while they can't understand why she never made the Holy Land trip and that that hurt, they still feel that she represents something that I think has been forgotten, that that is that she wasn't a me person. I'm Ellen Bessner, and this is what Jewish Canada sounds like for Monday, September the 12th, 2022. Welcome to the CJN Daily, the podcast of the Canadian Jewish News, sponsored by Metropia. People may have mixed feelings about the monarchy, I'll grant you that, but the Queen's death is also very personal for some people, including Bridget Grant. She's a British journalist, she's based in London, and the features editor of the Jewish News, which is the largest Jewish newspaper in the British capital. Bridget spoke to us while she and her team were scrambling to cover this breaking story. We want to start off, of course, by saying how sorry I am uh, for your losses, because we we know that it's it's a crazy time, a busy time, but also personally you're feeling it too, right? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm a huge royalist. I come from a family. My grandmother and my mother, massive fans of the Queen and, you know, just from when we were very small, watching those kind of used to see behind the scenes of the palace then and they used to make those documentaries and with the queen laughing with her own family I mean we were glued to those when we were little and it's resonated with my daughter um they're feeling it in school she's at a Jewish school um very close to here and I you know it's yeah it's overwhelming they not cancel school or did they have some kind of a semi no there was I believe that um uh, the funeral, which will be September 19th, Monday, September 19th, um, there will be no school then. Uh, and she's going to be lying in state, of course, which, I mean, you know, my husband and I talked about that last night. And uh, I don't know. I don't know if that's... Um, I, I think I'm too close to my own loss and grief to be able to withstand standing on line and walking in to see her. Also, I, you know, I just, it's hard to think of her as not being the the queen. I only ever, I saw her, like I was in the same room with her once, uh, many years ago, when there was, um, an, a, I think, I can't believe it was an official banquet. It was a lunch banquet of some kind with the religious heads of state. And there was Robert Runcie and at the time, um, Lord Chief, Jacobovitz, who was there, and 
it, it was weird because, you know, these days security is so tight because of the level of, you know, a worry of terrorism and things like that. But we weren't as on it, despite the whole Irish thing, we weren't as on it. And we wandered in with very vague passes. Then she walked in and this very diminutive, you know, kind of like she's almost surrounded by it was like it feels like a, a kind of haze of light almost because it's the queen and you actually can't believe you're in the same room at the same time with the queen I mean I, I, I never forgot that moment because I think you know when I was on national newspapers I, I, I did a lot of stories with Diana and met Diana and um, but the being in the room with the queen I think everybody felt and has said that it was, it was like being, it was a totally different experience. Can you speak to us a little bit about how British Jews are feeling and what are they saying? I mean, we, we've been in a situation for the past, what, three, almost three years now of teaching our children about things we've never encountered before from the COVID lockdown. And, you know, memorably, the Queen came on and spoke to the nation and famously said, we will meet again from the Vera Lynn song that was sung during the war. And that is really the key. I think that the older Jewish generation feel this very deeply. Young people generally have a very different perception about, you know, who who the monarchy are, um, what their relationship is with the Queen. Um, it's... I think people who went through, Jewish people who went through the war years, people who have Holocaust survivors in their families have a very different take. You know, they were deeply moved and honoured when they were invited to anything attended by the Queen. I don't think that it resonates quite as much with a lot of younger people. I can't speak for all. I mean, my own daughter specifically was crying a lot. Well, let's break some of that down. Let's talk first about the fact that of 120 countries she went to, there was sort of this unofficial boycott of Israel. Can you explain that? What are they saying about why? It was never it was never really qualified why she didn't go. I mean that was that was that was a bitter pill really because she went to everywhere and um and it did take her an awful long time actually to go to uh the uh, the Auschwitz memorial that she eventually went to and um uh, that that jars with a lot of Jewish people here um that they the reams has been written about it elsewhere and I've seen lots of people saying you know that it was disgraceful um and yet there is still this there was this respect uh this acknowledgement of her giving her entire life from a young woman to her death to this country and its people she was about the others despite it not incorporating as well, but she was about, she was looking out as opposed to we've become very insular, a selfie obsessed generation of people. And she was about respect, um, commitment, commitment to the task. And of course, in synagogue tomorrow, I would imagine that the, um, the, the rabbis in various synagogues, uh, regardless of their uh, you know, whether they're united or reform, progressive, they will address her her death in, in their sermon. Um, and, of course, we, I don't know whether that happens in Canada, you, you do the prayer. Prayer for the country and all its leaders. And we say, God save the queen, of course, and we sing it, not in synagogue. But you actually have had this specific prayer for the welfare of the queen, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. Many things. I mean, it's part of, you know, you, uh, uh, bar mitzvahs. I mean, all those bar mitzvahs years ago used to have that, that there was, you know, grace after meals, followed by, you know, that was a, a prayer for the royal family, prayer for the state of Israel. I mean, that was what happened. And um, it, it, it's... It's it's weird because in my synagogue, um, obviously we have um, the prayer for the armed forces in in Israel, and <laughs> followed by the prayer for the, the the royal family, which obviously, as I said, would jar with some people because she never went there. But I I mean I personally can't I can't linger on that. Um, 
she she had her own reasons and she wasn't one it's not like the queen did you know did that famous interview in the times where she talked about it there was never you know she had her reasons i'd like to think that they I'd like to think that they weren't wholly political. I, I think that that would be awful because she met, she met with the head, you know, she did meet with the the leaders of Israel, various prime ministers over the years, their wives, um, um, and they they made a point certainly in this country of whenever uh, 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 an Israeli prime minister would come here, that things were organised around the royal you know, the royal presence, as it were. They would meet with them. And so I, I just like to think it's not, I don't know, maybe I'm being naive. I mean, you know, the, the Israeli fighters, they blew up the King David Hotel. The British mandate uh, was, uh, they didn't allow Jews to go into Palestine. Uh, there was a lot of support for the Arab side during the War of Independence, of course. And, and so that whole fraught relationship with Arab states and how to repair that um, must be a framework of some 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 importance but as you said you're not the political expert on this but no i'm not and also the other thing is that that well, she's not as you know although she you know is is the official head of state or she didn't um she wasn't meant to be in to comment or be involved and this is where it gets difficult for charles because because of the length of time he has not been on the throne you know like He's had the freedom to comment on many things that she, as a 20-year-old woman who took the throne then, didn't have the chance. So if she was guided on the, uh, it would have come from, it would have been advisories that had said, perhaps it's not wise, ma'am, for you to be seen to go to Israel. Um, but she would never have been able to make she would, no political statement because she didn't. She didn't make. It's always been dignified in these difficult times. How are people were feeling in the Jewish community about having Charles as their as their king now? I, I he's had a much closer relationship as has William and Kate um, with the Jewish community here. Um, you know, much more forthcoming, involved with. Uh, charities appearing at Jewish and you know wearing a couple he had lots of occupy he was uh, at things for uh, um uh rabbi Sachs when um lord uh, chief rabbi Sachs uh died jonathan he he was you know very forthcoming about the loss of him and and what a significant man he was he and that is already there so there is no question about whether or not he will be supportive of the community and William, very much so. I mean, both he and Kate were involved in all of the um, Auschwitz anniversary um, uh, uh, events and she did a big, I mean, for our own newspaper, she did a big photographic story. Um, and, uh, you know, they turn up for, for very many things. So that is something I think, I mean, obviously they're famously connected to um Prince Philip's mother, Princess Alice, who uh, rescued and hid Jews and is buried on the Mount of, of Olives. So I think that that, that that is significant as well. It's not nothing's wonderful about the royal family. They they in the same way we all have, you know, things and broiguses and, and all those other things that that, that they, they, they hid them away. They they would have preferred it if everything could have been hidden away and that's why it's sad that at the end of her life there is so much that's antagonistic and provocative around the royal family with Prince Harry and Meghan and then you know now with the king I think that it's a uh, uh, that that oh I just hope I hope this I hope it all goes well you know like you know that's what you say I just hope it all goes well. You mentioned that wearing the kippa. I was told that, um, first of all, there's a lot of other Jewish uh, aspects to to this royal family. First of all, is it true that the royal family had their boys circumcised by uh, a Jacob Snowman, a Mohel? Yeah. A and Jewish why would they do that if it's... Because, Somehow. because well, I, I don't know why he was... Maybe because they thought he was the expert. I'm not quite sure. Uh, because I think that the royals have always had been circumcised. Always have. 
Um, I, I want to ask you one final thing, and that you've written about dogs, Jewish-owned dogs, and dogs on Instagram. And of course, the, the Queen has famously loved pets and corgis and horses. Is there anything Jewishy that you know about her and her dogs or her horses? As you know, it's funny because when you say King Charles, it, uh, we had a King Charles Spaniel. And of course, that's where it comes from. And I, for a long time now, the, the Jewish dog, dog, dog of choice has been the Cavapoo, the Cavalier Poodle Mix. Is, uh, there isn't a Jewish family in this part of London that doesn't have that dog. And I wonder if there will be a renaissance of the um, the King Charles Cavalier as the dog to have in light of his ac accession to the throne. In this country, Queen Elizabeth presided over events even for the Jewish community, like in 1973 when she laid a cornerstone for the new Mount Sinai Hospital building in Toronto. Or in 2010, on her last royal visit, when she met both the late Rabbi Reuven Bolka and Rabbi Chaim Mendelssohn in Ottawa. But no one in Canada had quite as unique a relationship with her as Myra Freeman of Halifax. Freeman was appointed Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia in 2000. She was the Queen's representative in that province till 2006. Freeman was the first Jewish woman to hold that role ever in Canada and only the second Jewish LG anywhere in the history of the Commonwealth. So Freeman koshered her official residence. Then she flew to Buckingham Palace to present her credentials with her husband, Larry. And she had a long tete-a-tete -tete with the monarch. So you actually physically, personally met her when you were in Buckingham Palace to, yes. is it called presenting your credentials or how does that work? Presenting credentials, yes. And, but I also met her prior to that because she was in Halifax in 1995 and uh, I was um, sworn into office in 2000. Uh, she came and was guests of uh, Prime Minister Kretchen and his wife, Ms. Madame Kretchen. And uh, we were invited, there was a large dinner and we were invited to that uh, just because we were very involved in community. And I can recall uh, getting a little um, voice came over to us and sort of whispered in our ear at the dinner that um, uh, the Prime Minister would very much like to introduce you and your husband to Her Majesty. And so we were asked to leave and go into a small waiting room. And I remember that they, they passed around chocolate covered strawberries. Now who's going to eat a chocolate covered strawberry when they're going to shake hands with Her Majesty, right? <laughs> um, it was a very brief conversation, but it was very, very meaningful. And then I was sworn in. And then you have, it's usually within your first year of office that you're asked to go over and meet uh, with Her Majesty as her representative. And we chose to go over in May on the recommendation of a, a, a former Lieutenant Governor uh, who said, it's very important that you have sort of uh, some experience already in the job because you'll be more comfortable talking to her about things. So we took that advice. Um, and I remember driving up to the, to a, a, not the main entrance because they were doing renovations, but uh, we came in sort of, we were met and taken in a smaller entrance and waited in a small room um, for the meeting. We were greeted by an equerry and a lady in waiting. And I think it was when the lady in waiting said, you do know how to curtsy. And I, you know, I know how you put your leg, leg behind, but she actually did it. And she was almost down her knee to the floor. And I was thinking, oh, I'll never be able to get that. And then we were instructed that when the door opens, uh, I'm to walk in the door and, um, uh, your majesty and then stand to the side and Larry would walk in the door and he would do a neck bow and we would come forward and they were giving all these instructions at the same time and I wasn't nervous until all these instructions came at us and at that point um, the door opened <laughs> and I walked in and I said hello <laughs> because 
I was just overwhelmed by, first of all, it's architectural intimidation when you look at this magnificent room. Uh, but we gathered ourselves together and we were invited to come, uh, we were invited to sit down. Now, you can imagine it would feel like being at the principal's office. We were sitting on the edge of our seats, our hands were folded, and we, we waited till she spoke. Within minutes, we were completely relaxed. And I think that this is one of the most important legacies that um, Her Majesty has left, and that is the warmth and her humor and making people feel totally at ease and comfortable. She, uh, uh, Her Majesty has made many trips to Canada and it was one of the only nations that she's visited as much. She had a true love for the country and she has memories. Her memory served her well. She remembered the name of the housekeeper at Government House that has been there for 50 years. So you met with her and was Philip there too at the time? No, or just it's the only, it's only. With and, that, and then what did you guys do? Did you have like emails or weekly letters or how did you stay in touch with her over the six well, years that you were in in the office? Well, you really work through uh, Heritage Canada and anything that you want to write um, or communicate uh, goes through Heritage Canada, they send it forward. Did she ever give you anything or did you ever give oh, them? Yes, we chatted for 45 minutes. You certainly don't talk about her family, but you know, you talk about issues. And I remember it was mad cow disease at the time. So the impact, we talked about that. And as we were leaving the room, and I always wondered how will we know when to leave? And they said, well, on her table, on next to her chair, she has she'll reach over and underneath is a button. And when she buzzes the button, you won't hear it, but the doors will open and the echo we will come in. And so she, and then she will stand up and you will stand up. And that's exactly what happened. And as she's walking us to the door, she picks up two portraits, two pictures in beautiful leather with the ER on the bottom, the, uh, one of her and one of Prince Philip. And she passes it to us and she says, and, and this is our gift to you. And then I realized I didn't present the present. And then I saw it in the corner of the room and I walked back to get them to do it. And, and they, you're not supposed to deviate from the plan, but I said, I just need to tell you the story. And she listened to it and she was very happy. And that was that. The pictures that she gave you, where are they? Oh, they're, they're the pictures. Oh, where are they? They're uh, in, in my cottage. I'm not here at the cottage now, but they are in a very special spot. And- um, So where I'm, exactly, where are they? Oh, they're in a, in a curio, in a cabinet, a shelving, okay? And they're near, uh, while we were in London, we were able to find on a recent trip, one of those cardboard stand-up full-size pictures of Her Majesty, which is, in the window of our entryway. <laughs> so she greets everybody who comes into our house. Going back to your discussions when you presented your credentials, did she know you were the first Jewish woman yes, to be? She, she tell did. us a bit about that whole thing, can you? Well, there wasn't much discussion about it, but she did know that uh, we were. She did know that the house was a kosher, we kosher government house. Uh, and she respected um all of that for it uh, with what we were doing and um, very open-minded. I mean, it's not something that you think of the Queen of England and the Church of England to be, you know, um, accepting of it. But Her Majesty uh, has more experience with more people from more places and is very, um, curious and interested in ensuring that uh, everyone values um, community. So because you're Lieutenant Governor at work, do you get to go to the funeral now? Were you invited? How is anything? What, so what I, obviously the funeral you? arrangements are still being worked out. However, when you consider the ex excessive number of international uh, and uh, the precedence list, and all the current people, it's a big list. And um, 
I have no idea what will happen, but I don't expect that they're going to invite all former left-handed governors across the country, across the Commonwealth. Uh, but if they did, I'd be there. And that's what Jewish Canada sounds like for this special episode on the Queen of the CJN Daily, the podcast of the Canadian Jewish News, sponsored by Metropia. Integrity, community, quality, and customer care. Today's listener shout-out goes to Bruria Cooperman of Toronto. And we'll end the episode with Rabbi Yael Splansky of Holy Blossom Temple in Toronto. She told her congregation on Saturday that despite the royal family's ancient, fraught relationship with the Jewish people, Queen Elizabeth II was, quote, good for the Jews. Thanks for listening. Against the backdrop to, of Jewish history, such affection and mutual admiration between the Queen and her Jews is remarkable. It must be noted. After a series of massacres and 200 years of brutal anti-Semitism, the edict of Jewish expulsion from England was a royal decree issued by King Edward I, July 1290. The expulsion edict remained in force throughout all of the Middle Ages. The edict was eventually overturned more than 350 years later during the Protectorate when Oliver Cromwell permitted Jews to return to settle in England in the year 1657. So by comparison, yes, there is no doubt Queen Elizabeth II was good for the Jews. This week, Rabbi Ephraim Mervis, the United Kingdom's current chief rabbi, said Queen Elizabeth cherished the Jewish communities in the countries over which she reigned. We recall with much appreciation the warm relationship she had with the Jewish community, with a particular commitment to interfaith relations and Holocaust memorial. 